All right, welcome everybody to the March 16th Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. Um, for those of you who don't typically join us, uh, but you're probably also aware we do have to abide by two things on this call. The first is the antitrust policy that is currently being displayed on the screen. Um, so uh, basically don't, uh, don't act in any way that's going to in impact any of the applicable antitrust or competition laws that might exist. Um, the second one is our code of conduct. Basically, don't be a jerk um, and we will all get along just fine. And then, uh, yeah, I guess for the meeting today, we have our typical announcement. The Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. Uh, if you have anything that you would like to include in that newsletter, please do leave a link or a comment at the uh, link that is linked in the agenda uh, for the upcoming newsletter. As far as quarterly reports, uh, I believe the only one that's really outstanding for us to take a look at is the Firefly one. I believe there are six um, TOC members who have reviewed that, at least as of yesterday. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to review that, please do. We do also have one comment on that report that is outstanding. Uh, and based on our rules, we cannot merge that until that um, is either addressed or um, until the, the comment is, is somehow removed. So we, we do need to take care of that Firefly one. Um, as far as the past due reports uh, with Hyperledger Grid, uh, you may have seen there was a conversation on the Discord channel uh, we're looking to potentially move that project to end of life. Uh, there is a issue that I have opened in the TOC repo. The um, we'll probably give a give a moment for um, people to take a look at that and review that. It's copied the grid contributors. I know Rai has opened up a number of uh, issues in the different grid repos to allow for the grid contributors and maintainers to, to reflect on that and see if there's any comments. And we'll probably bring that up to the TOC for a vote next week if we haven't seen any comments to the contrary. So, um, so far, Dan and Arno, you've commented on that particular issue with a thumbs up, um, but we'll uh, be revisiting that again next week. Uh, the Transact one, uh, I'm still waiting on a list of maintainers from Transact uh, based on the conversation that I was having there with Sean to determine what its status will be. Um, we may just do a very similar sort of thing uh, with that and open up an issue and see if we can get some responses coming from the different maintainers from Transact. Uh, as far as upcoming reports, we do have the URSA one that is for Q1. Uh, I know we just got the Q4 one a couple weeks ago, uh, but the Q1 is now up for, um, for review again. So we'll look to see if we can get the URSA community to report on their Q1 work. We also have Beisu and Caliper that's coming up next week. Any questions on the, the reports as we stand right now? Okay, I will take that as no. So for discussion items today, we do have three items. We have the brand update from Ben, who's going to tell us about what's happening there. Uh, we have the maintainer guideline PR that we talked about a bit last week, but uh, we'll hopefully bring that up for um, further discussion and potentially a decision there. And then we have the task force discussion for the onboarding content. So with that, I'm going to hand it to Ben to give us an update on the brand. Thank you, Tracy. I'm just gonna share my screen here, if that's all right. Sounds good. Two seconds. Okay. 
Uh, firstly, thank you. A shout out to David Boswell and Tracy as well um, for bringing this to everyone's attention and working with me to help uh, uh, bring this to the community and uh, roll out plan, plan for the rebrand. This is something we've been working on over the last four months now. Um, why do we need to rebrand? It's The current brand is seven years old. Um, the stretch has been a stretch as far as it can. Uh, and we've the, the team's decided it needs a strong refresh um, to make it more marketable for prospective members and uh, to strip away the frills and excess design appeal uh, to, to appeal more to developers. As some of, you, uh, some of you may or may not know, this is what we've been up to, um, but we wanted to make sure that uh, we, we bring it to the community uh, in a timely manner that doesn't upset or surprise anyone. I've been working with the marketing committee on this as well, who've been heavily involved uh, with us and the team uh, throughout various uh, stages of, of the rebrand. Um, and we've also presented it to the governing board. Thanks, thanks to Tracy as well, who provided some really excellent feedback. Um, so at this point, uh, I'm happy to uh, basically present it to the TOC and the plan moving forward will be um, to uh, roll it out into the community and hopefully launch it alongside a new website. Um, as most of you probably know, our website is, um, uh, is, is increasingly performing badly. Uh, the load times are terrible. It's it's pretty much falling over at this point. So we're upgrading to a new HubSpot website that will hugely increase performance. Uh, and the thinking is to launch that with the new brand in about two and a half months. Uh, sorry, the rationalization behind uh, the new brand is that um, we want to uh, have it be, be more of a direct representation of the blockchain business community. Um, have the brand colors reflect more of our three top values, uh, trusted, open, and enterprise grade, and most importantly, differentiate ourselves from all other members and the crypto community. Um, the new icon, I think, is an is a improvement on the current one, which doesn't scale very well um, across all properties in terms of sizing. Uh, it now represents the, the trinity of nodes, foundation members, and community, and uh, while still retaining the character and memorability of the current icon, it's essentially exact, almost exactly the same shape, angle, uh, and node style, but visually stronger. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, it's uh, it's way more scalable. So with that, without further ado, this is the new uh, logo, brand mark, icon, uh, color scheme as well, <clears throat> in vertical. And this is how it will look across the new website this is basically a kind of mock-up to, to give you an idea of the look and feel it's a lot cleaner it's a lot stronger and again these photos are just for mock-up purposes but we're going to use photos sparingly uh, with layered graphics to create more depth much simpler ux ui And again, we're reworking uh, the website uh, to bring it up to speed. And uh, basically, the, the whole purpose is to bring High Pledger Foundation brand into the future and make it way more appealing for prospective members and uh, and put it future forward. Uh, I'm working with the LF team as well to the design team and the web website team to make sure the website uh, is a lot stronger, uh, as I said, high, much higher performing and that the UX and the UI are really spot on. We, uh, for example, um, most users spend uh, an average of just under two minutes uh, in total on the website. So we wanna make sure that uh, it's extremely clear, the information is, is very accessible, uh, and we're gonna you know, really start stripping back a lot of the convoluted information that's currently on display so that the user journey is much more straightforward and if you need to deep dive and find the access, uh, access the information, the detailed information you're looking for, that is a lot clearer to find as well. The plan is um, to launch hopefully mid June. Um, as you can see, here's the uh, the, the website design timeframe. Uh, we had the the final revision of the brand delivered in March. Um, 
and we plan uh we've as i said we've shared it with the governing board we've shared we we've worked closely with the marketing committee now we're sharing it with you guys uh and uh, the plan is to share it with project leaders next and essentially roll it out to the to the community uh, uh over the next month so that in mid-june there isn't a big shock and surprise uh, if there's any questions uh, or any feedback more than happy to take it please uh, get in touch with me directly thanks tracy all right thanks ben any any comments or questions for for ben at this point I've seen a couple of thumbs up, Ben, uh, just for your reference. So. Right. So, so far, no questions, no comments. Oh, I guess one. Um, will this spill over and will this impact the um, per project logos or do they, will they kind of fit in, do we think? Yes, good question. Um, we, uh, I think we're going to do it. Uh, so we're going to do the transition slowly first it's going to be the website and uh and the the launch of of the new brand of essentially what you've just seen here um we would like to bring the uh the actual brand mark just the hyperledger font in in line across across the community but i think the plan is to roll that out slowly again you know in a timely fashion we're not talking about rebranding um icons none of the project icons are going to change we may look at uh, updating the the sig icons for example at some point but yeah we the plan is to is to is to do it collectively uh, and in in a fashion that doesn't you know surprise or upset anyone all right sandy yeah i uh, can you guys hear me okay mm -hmm. we can hear you uh, yeah, thanks. So I, I guess one question I want to bring up is that uh, I also see sometimes we have an overlap between other Linux Foundation entities, like especially like say TOAP. Um, are we also thinking of delineating uh, uh, work here like we do, especially in the field of, uh, you know, DI, uh, like compared to what other organizations do? And I think that's going to be helpful because otherwise a bunch of times there's a, you know, there's quite a bit of confusion as to, exactly like like of course we have you know aries and ursa and 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 they but there's quite a bit of overlap between what other organizations are doing so i think it may be helpful also to have some better delineation over there can you help clarify the delineation exactly in terms of project logos and branding or well not just in terms of the graphics i'm uh right like like what i'm saying is that uh and, and correct me if i'm wrong maybe this is uh, like if this is not the right uh you know scope for that but basically what i'm trying to say is that i i guess w one of the reasons we're doing rebranding here is to uh because when people come in you especially want to appeal to the developers and and have like not not just basically make this like marketing but uh, people can have a clear understanding of what hyperledger uh, involvement can help them with, correct? Like, like to prospective members and also to the developer community. Sure. Uh, right now, in in my own experience, what I've seen is that uh, especially people are like I, I think there's a bunch of like obviously the major hyperledger projects, uh, whether that's Fabric or Ursa uh, or, mm. or other ones, they or Eroha or all these other ones, they have a very clear uh, use uh, like and 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 very clear set of use cases. But when it comes to decentralized identity, I think there's a bit of an overlap. Like and I've seen the same thing happening in the identity work group where uh, I, I believe I brought that up in one of the previous meetings today, that uh, it's not really clear as to, you know, what what is the uh, uh, desired outcome um, and and uh, from the identity projects we're working on in Hyperledger versus in uh, TOIP, and they're both, of course, falling under the Linux Foundation umbrella. Now, of course, W3C is a completely different thing. DIF is different, mm -hmm. but at least within the Linux Foundation uh, ecosystem, I. I'm I'm hoping we can uh like like when we are you know having some uh, uh like like when we, especially when we have the project information here 
I guess it'd be helpful if you can clearly say, well, here's what hyperledger is doing, here's what like, you know, and if you want to do X, Y, Z, then uh, DIP uh, is, is where you better, uh, you know, uh, collaborate over there. Oh yeah, sure. I, I think I, I think I hear what you're saying. The, I've, <clears throat> um, maybe this will answer your question. Uh, hopefully, I've been working with closely with David Boswell on this, and he's been leading the charge in terms of updating the project page, for example. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we've been doing a good job of clearly delineating and uh, explaining projects and the overlap of projects. We are working on an entirely new project page and project matrix, which really uh, is helping to define uh, and explain exactly what projects are, what they do, what they use for, and how they overlap as well. So there is a new matrix in the works. And yet yeah, the, the goal of the UX and UI uh, website update over the, uh, the course of the next month is to is to make everything a lot cleaner, a lot clearer. Um, as yeah, as I said, we've we've only got a few minutes to to make sure we direct people to the right things and uh, explain everything as clearly and as quickly as possible. So yeah, um, hope, does does that un hope, hopefully answer your question a bit better? Uh, it, it does, Ben. Thank you. And and I think like in in that matrix, I think it'd be also helpful if you can say yeah, also somehow show what is his relation uh, with the other. Uh, you know, uh, Linux Foundation projects, or, or in general with the other okay. uh, uh, open source projects like like W3C, like what you know, like W3C is basically of course status setting standards. Yeah. But uh, like for example, TUIP is coming up with, uh, and, and like like of course we talk about Open Wallet Foundation. So uh, like like anybody who's a newcomer in the DI space, then they would know it's like oh, uh, if you're talking about wallets, then you got to work with the Open Wallet Foundation, but uh, if you're just talking about the cryptographic uh, thing, then you probably focus more on the OSA side of things. I see what you're saying. Yeah, good, good point. Thanks. Noted. Thank you. Stephen? A much lighter topic. Um, greens. <laughs> A number of the logos have greens. I noticed the use of green in this. Um, that was that would be my only concern about the the project logos would be um either contrasting or or uh, need for alignment of the of the greens being used in the projects and the projects i'm involved with are both using that so right. there you go <laughs> yeah thanks yeah thanks it <laughs> it is it is, a, it is a, it's a complex design task and yeah we're making uh, we're getting yeah. many iterations of the uh, of the web design and layout to make sure that uh yeah we're we're, we're, we're clean and clarifying all of those design elements, thanks. Art. Hey, I just wanted to comment on uh, Sandy's point. Uh, so I will say, Sandy, that at the LF level, uh, we are working on something that people have internally called the Digital Trust Initiative, which although that will probably change in terms of name, uh, what it is doing will stay the same. And that is exactly what you suggested to uh, have a place where we put all of the projects involved in digital trust, like, you know, obviously identity and, and some others uh, in context. Uh, so we explained the relationship between all of them uh, and, you know, tell people where to go for different uh, things that they're looking. Um, so we, we know this like identity, you know, we know there are a lot of projects in the LF that, that there's some overlap in identity um, and, and we're working on this uh, at an LF level to to make sure that you know people can find them all and they they know where they need to go. Thank you, Hart. Noted. Right. Morning. Um, great, uh, great stuff, Ben. My, uh, I've always wondered about the members and the the uh, visibility of the members that support this. Uh, phenomenal um, foundation, and it seems they're buried. Um, in the about section, I think on the current website, and I just uh, wonder whether they should have a, uh, a more prominent standing somewhere on the, uh, uh, within, the uh, within the website. But other than that, uh, phenomenal work. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate it. Yes, totally agree. Uh, members are kind of hidden away on the, on the current site. But again, we're redesigning the membership page. Uh, members are going to be front and center and the two clear journeys uh, for uh, uh, 
uh, new developers wanting to enter the ecosystem, uh, current developers, uh, maintainers and contributors uh, able to, returning visitors able to access things a lot quicker. Uh, and, and of course, yes, members uh, were really completely redesigning the membership page. Um, the, the, the home page again will be much cleaner, uh, focusing a lot more on the members. Um, so yes, the, we've got, we, we've got those journeys in mind and the plan is to definitely put them more front and center. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. All right. Well, thanks Ben for providing us the, the brand update. Um, again, if anybody has any additional questions or comments, please reach out directly to, to Ben. We will now move on to the maintainer guideline PR. Um, I think the only item that is really open on this at this point uh, is this question of what is required in the maintainers guidelines as far as information about the maintainers themselves. This particular um, comment uh, that's here. So I think previously we required that. Uh, you had to have um, all of these fields. I think the way in which the PR is written right now is that it is recommended to have these fields um, instead of a, a must. So I think that's, as far as I know, the only item that's open. So what does required mean? <laughs> so, and I'll, and I'll give you an example. When we retroactively, retroactively go to create these the way you do it is you find who's on the team uh the teams associated with the repo to see who has extra github pub, pub, um, permissions and the only information you've got is the name and the github id so when we create these um that's all you have that is the minimum and um um so uh, that's why I put it that way is that there's not a way to um, get the other ones. Their other ones are nice to have, um, but that's all you can get. So that's that's where I was coming from. And um, the second point was Ryan mentioned the the need is based on the ability to contact the person and GitHub ID, as far as I know, is sufficient to contact the person. So um, th that that's the second so the, it's actually both of those reasons that i put those two as required and the rest is optional but uh, i'm open to change i'm just saying that's that's the rationale okay i know so I, i'm i'm uh, puzzled by what steven just said how do you contact a person with just the id an at in a github message um, or, or you can you you know, to open often find associated with it. Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know why we're contacting. So I didn't have a comment on that, but that was because my that thought. Was good. So first I wanted to thank you for working on this. I think you, you deserve credit for putting this together. But uh, beside that, uh, I, I was going to say the, this, you know, it stems the, the initial information being requested to, stems from the fact that it's not often easy to figure out how to contact people. Uh, I mean, you just said, yeah, you can create an issue, I guess, and put a at or something like this. But other than that, it's not easy to contact people. And this is a key aspect we wanted to have is to be able to reach out to people. So unfortunately, uh, I mean, we have had discussions before about how much of the identity of the person needs to be known. Uh, you know, we, there are people who basically say nothing on their GitHub profile. You really don't know yeah. what they are. Yeah. And so that was primarily the, and then the company, company affiliation, all that obviously has more to do with you know, diversity requirements yeah. we have. But in terms of the rest, I think it had to do with this notion of, you know, the more information we can get on how to contact people, the better off we are. Some of it yeah, is would... historical though, because, uh, you know, like LFID and child ID, I think maybe we don't need all of that. 
Yeah, I, I, I think auto uh, definitely chat ID is uh, historical for sure. Um, I, I think that, you know, we have today the ability to at, you know, a group of maintainers uh, in Discord. So, you know, maybe that's not as required. I do see, right, uh, as we're dealing with, say, transact, um, the at transact maintainers um, isn't working to contact those folks in Discord. Um, you know, we'll, we'll uh, issue in GitHub, hit that, I don't know, you know, uh, we've only had one grid maintainer actually comment so far on that issue, right, regarding the end of life. So is that really enough? I don't know. Um, it should be right because it should hit their emails if they're watching it but if they've stopped watching it for some reason because they're not actively involved anymore then maybe that doesn't actually get to them um so i i think you know the the biggest thing truly is how do we how do we get in touch with people when we need to get in touch with people um you know in these cases of i'd hate to to move a project to a status and then you know the next week have people come in and complain because they weren't notified uh, that they, you know, didn't know what was going to happen. So, you know, those are the the sorts of things that I think about when it when it comes to contacting Stephen. You asked like when yeah. when would we contact people? Um, yeah. That's really I think the the majority of of what we would you know be looking for is to to make sure that we can truly touch these people when we need to touch these people. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, company affiliation truly was for the diversity requirement that we have for moving projects to graduate it. I think it's worth pointing out. I mean, you know, Stephen, you talked about filling out that information after the fact. Indeed, that's hard. That's hard. But if you know, for at least new maintainers, right? If mm -hmm. this is the information that is required, and you use a pull request to add a row to the table, it's yeah. it, it kind of you know, it, it's easy to capture that information at that time. Yes, absolutely. And that's and so I'm just kind of hung up on the on the <laughs> on the wording to use. That's all. Yeah. I, I'm really not sure what wording. So if anyone can suggest the wording, I'm happy to take it. I would like to see the LFID and chat ID dropped. Um, and I would like to see scope, um, scope uh, included in the required, so that we can you know, make sure we understand. I think I've done a better job now of explaining what scope is. Um, I hope um, that was that was the intention. And I think it it, it makes more sense um, in that it's mostly tied to what your GitHub privileges are on the repository, although it can um, it can be, you know, can, uh, left open the option to vary from, you know, unrelated to GitHub um, permissions. Um, and I would note, I did add from last week's discussion the um, the point about pointing a maintainer's file for a given repository to another maintainer's file. So that's in there as well now. But if someone can help with the wording on this little bit, and as I say, I, I think I I think we're saying LFID and chat ID come out. Oh, Hart's got his hand up. Yeah, can I make a point in favor of the LFID and the chat ID? It's going to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can um, always make it. Uh, we can ignore it. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, of course. Um, so the LFID is going to be very useful for our analytics, right? Like if we want to do LF analytics, um, you know, that that kind of thing is useful, uh, particularly for correlating across projects. Like if someone's working in Hyperledger and they're working in something else, uh, they may not be using the same GitHub ID. Uh, but you oh, know, interesting, interesting. If we if we can use the same LFI, if they use the same LFID, then we can uh, potentially uh, correlate across projects. Um, and if there ever becomes a time where, like, you know, we have to uh, lock things down more substantially, then then LFIDs will be, uh, you know, much more useful. Um, like we've yeah. been having a big issue, well, a bigger issue. We've had a number of uh, meetings Zoom bombed, 
uh, across the LF, you know, and, you know, I mean, you could imagine a scenario where like, you know, at some point, you know, if this becomes bad enough where you have to have an LFID to, uh, to join a meeting or something like that, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think that's good. And I also think it's important to link like uh, chat IDs uh, I know this is sort of done informally right now, but you know, Rai gives privileges in chat to maintainers, uh, and he sort of you know does this by hand right now. Okay. Uh, and having this you know done officially would make Rai's life much easier in this regard. I think, although Rai can can speak out on this himself. Agreed. Maintainers I really appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, maintainers do have special privileges in Discord. And like, if it's not official, then it becomes a big pain. So that's why I think those two should be included. Feel free to, <laughs> to do what you want, though. <laughs> so I have a suggestion. I mean, you know, would it be OK to say, OK, you can ask for all of this, but at least two must be provided? And, you know, so that way we have at least one additional way of contacting people. And then it's, if you don't really have those, it's okay. Yeah, I, I think, mean, you know, for, in response to, to the point you've just made with Rai doing by okay. it, you could say, well, look, if you don't provide your LFID, you won't get certain privileges. And yeah. that's it. Okay. I'm like, I think actually this is enough that I can put in the should be completed as as much as possible. And here's the rationale for why it, why the different pieces of data are needed. How about I do that? And I'll change it to Discord ID. Let's just assume we're going to stick with Discord for a while. Yeah, and Stephen, I and to, to Arno's comments, I think uh, you know the previous or the existing guidelines right before this PR say there must be at least one reliable mechanism to contact the maintainer, either chat ID or yeah. email. Um, so, you know, I, I think, I think what you're recommending is good. Um, and then uh, are there other comments besides this one that we should address? Um. What did people think? Uh, I, I was surprised there was very few comments on the um, list of ex example list of duties of maintainers. So I hope I got those down. I did get uh, go a couple of places for comments uh, or for feedback on that. Um, and as after last week's, I added to it the um, the need. It was it's in the sample maintainers. Um, the uh the security requirements so it's that list right at the bottom of the screen there yeah right there so i put right at the top after last week's discussion review responded act on any reported security vulnerabilities and i see the word reported in there twice which is bad um so i'll take one of those out <laughs> um but anyway th that's uh, a list that i found to be useful um, for what I, you know, what I've seen and what I think the duties of a maintainer are. But I think th this is actually the section of why I, I started down this path of, of adjusting this was to get this part right. And again, people can, uh, this is a sample one and people can adjust it. Um, t uh, maintainers can adjust it based on their their um, their project, but um, I think this is the really important part. I think you must have done a good job of capturing it since there were no comments. Okay, I'm just worried people <laughs> didn't look at it enough. That's the other option. <laughs> Steve, I uh, just wondering, Sandy here, uh, just because I don't know how this works today. Uh, do, do you want any sort of a scan? Uh, like, is this some 
like like is this some sort of like like in our bank for example we run the tenable scan uh for the volume body so uh like how frequently is that run and uh, uh is there like a specific team who does that on a routine basis sorry what was that again i i, I missed oh, for, for, for the volume body scan so uh how do how do the maintainers actually know what volume body is out there uh, they uh, are there any scans which are run by like a central team? Um, so whether the file's out there and whether it uh, exists? Uh, no, no, I'm sorry if I'm not clear, if my audio is not clear. Uh, what I'm uh, saying is that like, how do we run the vulnerability scans? Like, is, is like, like, oh, the, uh, how the vulnerability scan? Sorry. Um, so vulnerability scans come or, or things come from dependabot alerts. That's one which is showing here. And then the other is um, security reports on repositories. So security reports, that's the securities um, tab there. Um, oh, okay, the dependabot results are there. So those are the automated ones from essentially from GitHub. And then as well, um, individuals um, can report security vulnerabilities through this or through HackerOne. And when those are reported, those need to be paid attention to. And, and that was the discussion from last week. And that's why I put that as the highest um, priority is um, these matter. And we shouldn't have this many dependability alerts. Um, I assume this is not a, a good example, uh, not a happy example. I know of one in our world that's not a happy one that we're trying to get rid of the repository just because of it. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. I didn't. I was going through this uh, earlier, and that one just jumped out at me. Yeah, I will point out that um, the talk members of the talk have uh, read access on these repos specifically so that they can see the dependabot alerts. Okay, and that's across all. Uh, of Hyperledger, so. Okay. And, so, and, and I'm assuming that if we have to, if we cannot resolve and remediate something on a timely basis, uh, then we have some sort of an exception process for that. So uh, like like the, the example that just popped out here. So if we, for any reason, let's say uh, there's a project dependency or there's a timeline dependency, we cannot resolve this say by the end of March, uh, then we follow like, like maybe probably create an issue and then and put that on the, uh, um, uh, on, on some sort of a chart up there. So, so there is an issue that those security like CVEs, uh, so, you know, criti uh, critical vulnerability Correct. reports, those are issues and those get created as such. Um, for example, when we had one on Indy, a couple on Indy last year, they got added to a discord this session. We, we created a special channel for it and invited all the people to collaborate on it. But um, the whole thing is to try to make sure we um, stay on top of these. Uh, it's up to the project to do whatever the project is going to do. And it's up to, you know, all the maintainers on a repository. What I wanted to call out was I'm finding as new maintainers come on, they don't really realize that, oh, I could, I could. part of my duty is to make sure I'm looking at the bots um, results. Often they know that but they don't realize that, oh, you could get a, a, a an actual person reporting something. And, and when that happens, you have to deal with it and it's important. And so it needs to be top of your list. Um, coding, Thanks, I've yeah. got coding pretty far down that list. <laughs> um, third from the bottom. <laughs> There's lots of things that are, you know, important to do that maintainers should be doing ahead of simply um, writing code and, and, and putting it in. Hopefully the other things don't take a whole lot of time so that they, that third from the bottom gets lots of attention, but this is the order, um, the ordering matters, I think. That was the intention. Anyway, thanks for letting me highlight that. No Thanks, Steve. Um, so I, I think the um, next steps, then, Stephen, you're going to do another uh, yeah. commit to this. Um, yep. Make some changes. Uh, the TOC members, please let's review it on GitHub. 
uh, provide any additional comments that you might have, uh, approve if you think it's ready to go, and then uh, hopefully we can get this one closed out. Thank you, Stephen, for taking us through that. Uh, Bobby, you're up next. Thank you, Tracy. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, so basically, I'm here to talk about where we are with the onboarding task force. Um, so there's like a few new things going on. Uh, one is that we are uh, applying for a mentee to help us with the sections. We are uh, working on, let me just switch this over to the uh, GitHub. We're working on the four spots where people come into the community um, and the four different types of, I'm gonna call them learners, um, who need information. Um, so for the mentorship program, what we wanna do is we want to um, have the mentee help us develop these and kind of um, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, I did put out a survey, um, which is in the Discord channel for the um, onboarding task force, as well as the GitHub repository. Um, and it's just to find out what time zone and what um, of the uh, specific uh, pamphlets or guidelines that you'd like to work on um, and any comments you might have. So that when we get that together, I'm gonna sit down with David and we will figure out um, exactly what uh, we need to do to um, set up a time and a meetup so that we can get this really rolling and hopefully get uh, accepted into the mentorship program and have someone to help us do this. So um, again, I did post it in the Discord, but my Discord is being funny. So um, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Bobby obviously expected to have one minute to talk about given yeah. the agenda. <laughs> Didn't think I'd have a lot of time, especially with the maintainer conversation. <laughs> uh, but again, we're just having trouble because people are all over trying to figure out a convenient time because the meeting um, on the Monday afternoon isn't really working out for a lot of people. So we really want to get this started. So if anybody is interested in, in helping out with any of these landing points or these guides, please fill out the survey so that you can be included in the conversation. All right, thanks, Bobby. Uh, so I guess that was our agenda. We went through it um, quicker than I thought we would. So any any other topics that anybody would like to bring up or any anything that we should discuss before we close out? I have one question about the maintainers thing. Um, will there be will this be retroactive? Will we be expecting projects to come into compliance? And by we, of course, I mean all of you. I, I think we should promote it for sure. Um, I think it would be, a, you know, based on my, you know, limited but um, uh, interactions with maintainers on projects, I think there's not enough understanding of what the roles are and how you become one. And like, oh, man, I'm, you know, my, my PRs aren't getting reviewed fast enough. Well, um, a, that's a maintainer's job, but B, maybe it's time you became a maintainer or, or um, you know, and things like that. So that's the conversation I'd like to trigger in the, in the um, projects and repositories. So happy to see that. Okay. So one of the things I've been doing over the last week or so is when people uh, file a request to have someone add in GitHub, I've, I've been saying, fine, update maintainers and then we'll do it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And then, uh, you know, this would also be an opportunity to say, you know, bring your maintainers file up to snuff, but yes, I, yeah. you know. Yeah, well, let's get this out there. Let's get it uh, available to be pointed to. And then, yeah, let's get that right. going. Cool. All right, any other items for discussion today? All right, I will take that as please give me 10 minutes before my next meeting, please. 
Um, so we will close this meeting. We will talk again next week. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks bye. everyone.